Mai ma ke tuki tonga riro maunga te arawa te waka ma ke tu te ihu Rotorua te takere tau po te kei o te waka e Ko ue nuku ko pa ko piki ao tu haurangi ngā tii whao, ngā tii tahu, ko tahi tātau e. Tēnā tātou e te whare, nei aku mahi matakui koe atu ki a koutou i tēnei āta. E tū ana tēnei uri no te arawa waka, ngō ngā puhi nui tonu hoku. Tēnei hoki, aku mahi ki te mana whenua tēnei rohe Ngāti Whātua Tangata, Ngāti Whātua Paimaunga, Ngāti Whātua Moana, tēnā koutou katoa. I started today's presentation with a waiata, or a short part of a waiata, not because I'm a particularly good singer, but because I was raised to believe that singing, like eating and having a cup of tea, tea, Faka uh, noas, the environment. It makes us all ordinary to each other and uh, removes any kind of tapu or sacredness between us. Um, so that was why I started that way. It also helps to calm my nerves. <laughs> um, so I will start today just briefly by um, introducing you to who I am um, and why I'm here doing the mahi that I do. Um, so uh, on my father's side, I come from Rotorua which is where I grew up, in a small uh, town down there called Kotu. And uh, my father's people are from the Te Arawawaka and uh, the Ngāti Whakaue, uh, iwi, down there. Um, when I was born, I was uh, the first granddaughter after 11 grandsons. Um, so my grandparents requested me and I was given to them and I was raised down there with my grandparents. Um, my two brothers went with my mother, who is also Māori to the far north, which is where my mother is from. Uh, my mother is Ngāti Hau, which is from in and around the Whangarei region, Ngāti Hine, which is around Moirewa, and uh, Ngāti Kahu Te Pātū, which is up by Kaitaia. Um, so I plant my feet pretty firmly in both of these places. Um, my experiences, my whakapapa, my schooling and research experiences in these places shape who I am and what is, I think is important uh, in terms of education. Um, I'm a, te a primary trained teacher, um, so I spent most of my teaching career in junior classrooms and junior syndicates with five, six and seven year olds. Um, but I've been at the university now for 23 years uh, training teachers. I came back to Auckland College of Education um, where I trained and, uh, and have been here ever since and love my job. I love working in schools, I love working with pre-service teacher educators um, and most of my research uh, looks into school improvement and how we might be more culturally sustaining in our school-wide and teacher practices um, to meet the needs of all tamariki um, in our classrooms. But I bring a particularly Māori lens uh, to the work that I do and I hope that you're able to draw from these learnings today um, and and take them and apply to them to all tamariki in your classroom because whilst I might be speaking about Māori uh, students and the things I've learnt about Māori student motivation and engagement at school uh, the learnings can be applied to, to a range of diverse children um, in your classrooms. So I have to reach over here to change the slide. So today I'm going to be talking about a project called Kia Tūrangatira Ai. And Kia Tūrangatira Ai is a research project I've been doing for the last five years. Um, and uh, Kia Tūrangatira Ai basically means to stand in one's chiefliness, to stand as the chiefs we were born to be. And I take that idea, that strengths-based idea, that all young children in our classroom are chiefs, um, ready to manifest their mana in the world. And I think about what kinds of conditions and contexts and content uh, might enable that to happen for all of the young people in our schools. Um, and one of the two of the things that I'm going to be talking about today, among others, are the ways mataranga Māori can be useful um, in your curriculum and in your engagements with students and whānau, and the power of whakapapa narratives, the power of genealogical stories, ancestral stories that remind children who they are, who they come from, and who they can be uh, in this world. 
So I want to start today's kōrero around my mother's whakapapa as a means of locating myself in a culturally appropriate manner to illustrate the ways that whakapapa and mā tauranga Māori that are contained in those stories can be a powerful and enduring aspect of curriculum and to emphasise the importance of these matters to our work as educators and kaitautoko. And kaitautoko means supporters, because not everyone in here is a teacher in a classroom per se. There are some principals in here, there are some walking DPs and APs, and of course there are cognition staff as well. Um, I do this as a means of asserting that every Māori student has their own whakapapa, history and mana. I do this to illustrate the pedagogical potential of whakapapa narratives for what can be taught and learnt from Māori students in their whānau and the communities that they belong to. So I first of all want to introduce you to Rawiri Taifanga, the man with the great hat in the middle of the screen there, um, who was of Ngāti Tautahi and Ngāpuhi descent. He was one of the many rangatira from Taitukiro who flourished economically during the early to mid 18th century, 19th century, sorry. This time period was known as the golden age for Māori economically because hapu and rangatira featured heavily in both domestic and international business and enterprise. Taifanga honed his considerable horticultural and agricultural knowledge, both on the Kirikiri Mission Station and then in Sydney with Samuel Marsden. Some years later, Taifanga was simultaneously running a school and went into business, establishing a farm east of Te Kaikohekohe, now known as Kaikohe. Before long, Taifanga was selling produce, mostly butter, to a merchant in the Bay of Islands for international buyers. This makes Taifanga Aotearoa's first commercial dairy farmer. He was industrious, enterprising, a seeker of knowledge and an astute businessman. I also descend from Hine Amaru of Ngāti Hine, who's depicted in the carving. A rangatira of great mana, who was famed for her fear, fearless leadership of her iwi, her agricultural skills and her tenacity. Hine Amaru's family left Waimamaku in search of fertile land, travelling from Te Taitamatane, which is known as the Hokianga now, the west coast, the unpredictable coast, the coast that is said to embody the male element to Te Taitama Wahine, or Peo Whairangi, the Bay of Islands, the gentle and idyllic east coast that is said to embody the female element in our stories of these places. Here, Hine Amaru planted kumara seeds in tent mounds, a gardening technique called ahuahu. She planted the kumara in three different ways, rapiki with the stem facing east, retu facing north, and ratau facing, facing west to test the impact of the elements on the growth of the kumara. The following autumn, as the whānau returned from gathering seafood, Hine Amaru stopped in to check on the kumara. She was, she was overjoyed and relieved to see abundant crops and immediately set about digging up the ten mounds. After seeing and tasting the quality of the kumara, she declared that the land was perfect for permanent settlement. Hine Amaru was a scientist driven by a desire to provide for her people. She engaged with, engaged with centuries of mātauranga and pūtaiao to find the best conditions for her people. And finally, Suheke Nukumai Busby of Muri Whenua, a world-renowned expert in bridge building and waka voyaging, traditional navigation and seafaring. Papa Hek built 26 waka when he was alive using mā tauranga learnt from other tohunga. He knew to select trees that stood in a southwestern direction on a ridge facing the harsh weather. The side exposed to the rough weather was said to grow more slowly and would be denser and thus more suitable for the hull of the waka. The density of the wood at the bottom of the boat would add stability. After chopping the tree down, the heavier side could also be determined by floating it in the water because the heavier side, of course, would be at the bottom. Papa Heck was a gifted stargazer, a wayfinder, a weaver of traditional and contemporary engineering, scientific and navigational wisdoms. Now I use my mother's whakapapa here to illustrate that if we want to educate in ways that accelerate Māori student cultural pride, 
academic success and well-being at school, we need programs of learning that acknowledge and celebrate the lofty aspirations, histories, whakapapa and knowledge systems of students and the communities that they carry on their shoulders to school with them every day. Sadly, I never learnt anything about Ngāpuhi when I was at school, and I should have because I was schooled in those areas. Our rich history of scientific endeavour or our iwi heroes at school. The curriculum should have been localised to ensure that I learnt as much about Ngāti Hine scientist Hine Amaru, or the engineering and navigational genius of Sir Heck Busby as I did about physicist Sir Ed Ernest Rutherford, suffragist Kate Shepherd, or British cartographer James Cook. We need to ensure that Māori students know that they descend from greatness too. We need to arm them with a powerful and promising narrative about who they descend from, who they are now and who they can become. A narrative that speaks back to the ruinous stories and negative stereotypes that Māori students see about themselves every day in the mainstream media. Now in Aotearoa, as you know, we have an important educational policy called Kahikitia, now Kia Hapaitia, which stipulates that all Māori students should have opportunities to achieve educational success as Māori. However, my research has shown that many mainstream classrooms don't speak the language of Māori students. They really include our ways of knowing in the curriculum, and they almost never hold Māori ancestors up as role models of success or academic excellence. And yet we know by way of our own whakapapa, our cultural narratives and our distinguished history of oratory that we descend from a long lineage of excellence. And the discourses within Māori communities themselves don't focus on academic underachievement or deficit either. Instead, the focus is on the strengths, the wisdom and the opportunities Māori tamariki need to flourish, to be well, to excel. Māori families have told me that they want their tamariki to learn in educational contexts that teach them that their ancestors were exceptional, tenacious, courageous and clever. These concepts are critical in the reshaping of a new curriculum for Aotearoa, which of course is happening as we speak. Māori students must come to believe that their knowledge systems, including mātauranga Māori, language and culture have as much relevance in contemporary times as they did in the past. It helps them to feel a sense of pride, mana and connection to education. It acts as a metaphorical suit of armour for Māori students whose, whose identities can be invisibilised, pathologised, stereotyped and diminished in school contexts where they don't see themselves on the walls of the classroom and the staff of the school and the books that are used for their learning. So my work today in thinking about the context and the content and the conditions for Māori student thriving, I want to talk about this particular project called Kia Turanga Tira Ai. Now what I tried to do in this particular project was I tried to flip the script, to think about the kinds of questions I would want to be asked as a teacher about my practice. To think about the kinds of questions I as a mother would like to be asked about my aspirations for my daughter at school. And to think about the kinds of questions I might want to might have been asked as a student when I was going through school. I used strength-based strength surveys in the study to ask questions, to shine a light on what works in our schools. Because I work with lots of young people who are thriving at school. I also work with lots of whānau who wrap themselves around their tamariki so that they have all that they need to be secure in themselves and to get to school every, every day, aha kua te aha, regardless of what's going on in their lives. And I also train and work alongside a heap of teachers who are amazing, who work hard, who go the extra mile every day uh, to serve the tamariki in front of them. So I wanted in this project to shine a light on those things for a change, because I'm tired of reading papers that tell us we're racist, we're lazy, 
we, you know, don't, don't go the extra mile for our kids because I know that we do as teachers. So in this particular project, I focused on what motivates students to engage and persist at school? What is it that keeps them coming to school every day? Is it a great relationship with a particular teacher in the school? Is it a curiosity, an innate desire in a particular subject area in the school? You know, a, a love for science or maths or languages? arts? Uh, is it because they want a flash car and a flash house when they get older? Is it because they want to make their whānau proud? What is it that motivates our kids to come to school every day? Do we know why they're here every day and who it is that motivates them to be there? I wanted to know how they perceive themselves as learners. Do they see themselves as good learners? If they had to, you know, talk about the subjects that they were good at, what would they identify as their strengths, as their interests in learning? What are their attitudes towards school? Do young people consider themselves to be good listeners, good great teamwork members? Do they think that when they get homework, you know, that they feel equipped enough to do it? And one of the interesting things in this project was that I found out that most kids don't know about their attitudes towards school because the only time they get feedback on their attitudes is when they've got a bad one. So quite often they couldn't tell us, yes, I'm a good listener. Yes, I'm a great scribe when we have group activities. Um, I'm often the first to hand my homework in, you know, during the week. And young people are hungry for that kind of verbal affirmation. In fact, that was the most overwhelming piece of qualitative feedback when the question in the survey said, what do your favourite teachers do? They said, overwhelmingly, they tell me they're proud of me. They tell me what I'm good at. Kids are hungry for that. And they don't want it our way to her, you know, via, via osmosis or a smile or something. They want to hear you verbally tell them that they're good at particular things, that these are their, their strengths, that this is what you imagine for them in their future. Um, I wanted to know what job they wanted to do in the future because quite often we don't focus on careers and jobs until they get to secondary school. But often children in primary school already know the kinds of areas that they're interested in pursuing. They might know that they're particularly good in the arts and they want to do something creative in their future. And it's up to us to help plant those seeds about the kinds of skills and knowledges that they need in order to be able to pursue that particular career. So if a child says, I really love my uncle, he's a police officer, we can be saying, yeah, you know, police officers need to be good at communicating. They need to listen carefully, they need to be able to speak clearly, document things, and you're good at all of those things. Of course you can be a police officer. So we're just planting that seed in them that, you know, um, they have the skills to be able to reach those goals for themselves. I wanted to know uh, who their favourite teachers were and if they could describe their teachers in five words, what five words they, would they use? I also wanted to, them to tell me about the things that their whānau do to help them be successful at school. And even the youngest children, five-year-olds in the survey, could tell us exactly what their parents do, the sacrifices their parents make to get them to school every day. The things like making them healthy lunches, grandparents that drop them at school. Um, every day. Families saving up so that in the holidays the children can attend a Kip McGrath course for a week. All of those kinds of things. Kids notice what their parents do. Um, I wanted to know what role culture plays in their motivations to succeed because for the last 15 or so years I've been studying the ways Māori kids perceive themselves as learners and whether or not that can be aligned with how they perceive themselves as Māori. Because mo most of the literature would tell us that indigenous kids around the world, including Māori, separate being Māori from being smart. Okay, because they don't get messages that they can be both of those things. Um, well, they haven't in the past. I would say that that's changing uh, now. So I was really interested that if a child said, well, I'm Samoan, well, what, is, what, what makes you proud to be Samoan? And is that connected to being a good learner at school. Because in the American literature, psychological literature, they often talk about a concept called embedded achievement. And embedded achievement is when a child associates being a member of their group, whatever group that might be, it could be a religious group or a gender group or ethnicity, um, 
with success and thriving and goal setting. So it would be when a Māori child says, I'm successful because I'm Māori, not despite being Māori. Or I'm good at this subject because I'm a woman, I'm a girl, you know, and girls are whatever it might be. So that's called embedded achievement. It's when that sense of success and achievement and that can-do attitude resides within them because they believe in themselves. So this kind of idea of self-efficacy and academic efficacy and cultural efficacy, the belief that I can do in each of those areas is critical for all students, but particularly critical for students who come from stereotyped or marginalised groups. Those who have messages via a range of different sources that they're not successful at school because they're not as smart as others or because they come from particular groups. And I also wanted to know who their role models are. Because if you know who a child's role model is, you know a little bit about who they want to be in the future. Okay, so if you want to know what Māori success means to that child, ask them about a role model in their life, because that will determine what success looks um, like for them. So in the survey, we asked them to talk about a role model and to describe that role model in five words. And I would encourage all of you in your classrooms to do this with your children, because it will give you a real sense of not just the kind of academic or uh, curriculum areas that children love, but also the personal qualities that they hope to emulate. So for example, one of the young men in the study that I interviewed, um, who was a 16-year-old a secondary student from Rotorua. Um, and I said to him, tell me about a role model in your life, somebody who makes you feel good about yourself, somebody who you look up to. And he said, well, my role model is my grandfather, my koro. My koro is the best pig hunter in Murupara. And when my koro goes pig hunting, everyone on our street gets a kai. We chop it up, we go and deliver it to all the nannies and aunties. Everyone in Murupara loves my koro. I want to be like him. And I said, so what five words would you use to describe your koro? And he said, well, my koro's a scientist because you can't be a good pig hunter unless you understand the behaviour of pigs, unless you understand the behaviour of pig dogs. My koro always knows about the weather and my koro understands the lay of the land. You have to understand all of those things to be a pig hunter. That's science, he said. My koro is humble and generous because Important to him is making sure that everyone in our community is looked after, not just our family and our household. And my koro is fit and healthy, because you have to be to chase a pig around the forest for half a day. <laughs> now, this told me everything about who this young man wanted to be when he grew up. Not necessarily that he wanted to be a pig hunter, but that he saw science as valuable. He saw collective benefit is something that he wanted to contribute to in the future. And he knew that looking after yourself physically and spiritually and culturally was key to being successful and being able to look after your family. That's what Māori success is Māori meant for that young man. So role models are critically important um, in thinking about the hopes and aspirations of the tamariki in your classrooms. Now, when I put this particular grant into the Royal Society, it's called a Rutherford Discovery Fellowship. Um, I said in my application, I probably have around two or 3,000 applicants, because, uh, uh, survey respondents, sorry, because those are the connections I have to schools already. But once the survey went out, it, it went gangbusters, um, because I think schools were so hungry for positive research, that told them what was working, that shared good practice from other schools. Every school who participated in my study got reports uh, back. They got all their data back, first of all, organised in a spreadsheet. Here's the data, wānanga it with your staff. Uh, they got reports on the students, teachers and whānau responses to the survey. And they got an analysis from me saying, these are the things I think your school is doing really well, that kids say works for them, that parents say get them to school for meetings, etc. These are the things that you know, you've scored a little bit lower on, but other schools are doing these things to improve in those areas. So there's lots and lots of sharing. I went to every school and I introduced the project to the staff so that they knew why they were doing this project. Um, and I also presented to 
whānau hui, a whāstu or whono, um, so that families knew why they were doing it too. And in secondary schools, I spoke to lots of students as well. Um, and I went back to the schools that asked and I reported back verbally uh, to staff and whānau as well, we were asked, um, because that's what researchers should be doing when they're doing research in your schools. They should be giving back. And I, and I ask you to require that of them if they're requiring you to do mahi for them in the future. So anyway, I ended up with nearly 19,000 students, primary and secondary, who volunteered to complete the survey, um, which wasn't very long, it was four pages with mostly tick boxy questions. Um, I ended up with nearly 7,000 whānau who completed the survey. And the secret to my whānau responses was that we got the students to do the survey at school first, and then I asked students to go home with the survey document and interview their parents, or an older sibling, or their nana, or whoever it was in their life, and fill it out alongside them. So kids took that really seriously. Um, and they brought the survey back the next day, and it went into the school office. And that was, to my mind, a really successful way to get whānau to contribute, because it was their children themselves asking them about this information. And when a child says to you, what are your hopes for me in the future? What do you think I'll be really good at? Um, parents spend some time thinking about that. So the data was really rich. And uh, we had over 1,800 teachers respond as well. So, so I guess what I'm sharing with you by sharing this is that the, the things I'm talking to you about today are supported with empirical data. Um, it's a really robust, nationally representative survey. Um, and as much as I believe that qualitative data is just as important as quantitative, people like the ministry listen when you've got big numbers. Um, so there are those benefits as well. So I can't talk about all of this data today. I'd, you'd be here for three days or something like that. But I am going to talk about some particular points of interest in the data that I think are useful for you in thinking about what might culturally responsive pedagogy look like in my everyday actions. Do I need to be an expert on mātauranga Māori and whakapapa? to do this stuff? And the short answer is no. But you need to care about students' futures. You need to care about who they want to be, who their families you know, expect them to be, all of those kinds of things. So the first point of interest I want to point out today is that Māori primary students indicated to us, over 70% of them, that they are motivated, engaged, and supported at school. So it was a different story from the ones that we hear in the media that Māori children don't like coming to school. That's not what Māori kids said in this particular survey. Um, they're positively motivated to attend school. They feel like they participate in school activities. Uh, they report good levels of achievement and they feel supported and proud of who they are. Not only were Māori students' motivation and engagement practices predictive, of their self-reported achievements, so how good they thought they were uh, at learning, but they were also related to the perceptions of support networks and their cultural pride. Um, so what we did in this particular study is we took all of the, ma the students who identified themselves as primarily Māori. They, they were able to list all of the identities that be they belonged to, and then there was a question saying, which of these do you think is your main identity? And for the ones that selected Māori, there were 3,709 Māori primary students who selected that. 70% um, of them were in primary, and the other 30% were in intermediate schools. Um, and around 60% of them came from low decile schools throughout Aotearoa. So there was data collected from the far north right down to Dunedin. So there's a nice big spread of schools in this study. And what we did is we put all of the quantitative measures in the survey into what we call a cluster analysis, statistical cluster analysis. We basically checked them all together and we said, how do they clump together? And what does this tell us about the students that sit in those clusters? So in essence, we found five clusters and I'm just gonna go through some of them, not all of them, to give you a sense of, of who they are. The clusters we've named flourishing Māori students, thriving Māori students, striving, surviving and struggling Māori students. Um, and all of this, this the particular study is freely available online from NZCER. There's a study up there called Compass, Conceptualising Māori and Pacific Aspirations and Striving for Success. So there are four studies in that particular 
free PDF, um, including some Pacific studies as well. We did the same cluster analysis for Pacific students, for Pākehā students too. So if you're interested, you can find it online. It's really important to me that um, all of this stuff doesn't go into these crazy journals that you can't access because uh, you don't go to a university or something. So one of the other things that we're doing is making sure that our, um, my collaboration with places like NZCR, I mean, teachers have access to all of this data and all of these findings. So these are the things we clustered together. Okay, You don't need to know all of this, but we were interested in children's intrinsic motivation, the, the kind of internal desire of them to learn, um, their extrinsic motivation, whether or not they like praise, rewards, certificates, money, whatever it was. Uh, whānau motivation, so what, what they, they believed their parents or grandparents, whoever their extended whānau was, their aspirations. Was it a driver for kids learning at school? And it was, let me tell you that, for all New, all New Zealand students, not just Māori ones. New Zealand students, quite often in the international literature, intrinsic motivation, extrinsic and so what they've called social motivation are perceived of separately and they say that intrinsic is the best we want kids to have an internal drive to learn uh, but what our data has found this data has found is that um, uh, children throughout New Zealand have all of those motivations happening at the same time so we can't ignore the fact that kids like stickers they like teacher affirmation they like it when you text their nan to tell them they've moved up a reading level etc all of those things motivate kids uh, at school so we need to be really cognizant of that and not just expect them to have this in because it depends on the subject area. Isn't that true for all of us? We have an internal intrinsic motivation for particular things and boy, do I need praise and rewards to be able to do the others. Um, we were interested in their engagement. We looked at two things, emotional engagement. So that was how safe and connected they felt at school. And if they did feel safe, with whom and where? What is it? Where are those places in school where kids kind of flock to um, when they're feeling not emotionally secure. We were interested in their behavioural engagement, whether or not they turn up to school ready to learn. You know, whether they do believe that they do what they're told, they do their homework, etc. We looked at self-reported achievement, career aspirations, support networks, and cultural pride. And there were two things we looked at in cultural pride. Um, one was, well, there were two questions in the survey essentially, how proud do you feel of your own cultural group on a like it scale? from not, proud, not very proud to very proud, and uh, how proud do you think other people are of you and your cultural group? And of course there was always a difference between children's perceptions of themselves and how they believed others viewed themselves culturally. Um, so the first grouping we came across was who we've called flourishing Māori primary students. These are the kids that are just doing well at school. Okay, you can see here, if you can imagine that the zero isn't neutral, it's positive, because the questions were all positive in the survey, from zero, even, even just below zero, those are still average kinds of answers. Um, you can see here that they perceive themselves to have high behavioural engagement at school, they believe that they turned up ready to learn, etc. They felt safe and connected at school, and they had were motivated to be there. So this particular cluster of 831 students, um, were called flourishing because they prospered at school. They were highly motivated to achieve and behaviourally and emotionally engaged. They reported the highest levels of self-reported achievement, so they believed that they were really good learners. Um, the highest levels of cultural pride, so they were proud of themselves as Māori, because remember these are the Māori student results I'm talking about very proud of themselves as Māori, and they perceived that other people were proud of them as Māori, that being Māori mattered at school. It wasn't just another thing. It was actually central to who these children were. And I think this is really important because anecdotally for a long time we've been talking about how important Māori identity is, but we haven't had very much data to support that. It's just been kind of a feeling. Now we have data to say that Attending to children's cultural needs at school actually has an impact on their self-reported achievement, actually has an impact on their engagement and motivation at school. Um, they reported, interestingly, which is why it's in red there, I've tried to use a bit of a traffic light system so it's easy to spot things, um, the lowest number of people in their support networks. So these were kids who didn't actually believe that they needed others to help them be successful at school. They were just 
thriving on their own. They believed in themselves. Um, they were at school and regardless of whether they had a good teacher or a not so good teacher, which secondary kids were quite keen to tell me um, in, their, in their data, but they believed they could be successful at school regardless of that. So that's kind of interesting um, for me. So these kids were more likely to be female in years one to six and from lower decile schools. Um, they're more li likely to perceive strong whānau and teacher support networks. So even though they weren't likely, um, they didn't write too many role models down, they might have just written one, whereas other kids wrote three or four. These kids did say that their teachers supported them and their whānau supported them at school. Um, but they only had average motivation to get a job or attend university after secondary school. So that wasn't the driver for these kids. It was intrinsic motivation. It was that internal desire to learn. So this particular cluster was kind of interesting because these kids were kind of wholly independent, you know. Um, the second group, which is thriving primary students, which was the biggest group, again, and another positive group, basically thriving Māori students were those who were fully engaged at school and uh, who experienced slightly above average motivation, behavioural and emotional engagement. So again, these are kids who knew what to do at school, felt good about going to school, and knew why they were there. Um, they just reported average levels of self-reported achievement. So I say, these are the kinds of young people who said, I'm doing okay. You know, I'm not worried about, not worried about my learning at school. I think I can do things. Um, they still had high levels of cultural pride and perceptions of cultural success. Um, they had reasonably high numbers of people in their support network. So when asked to nominate role models, these were quite often the kids who nominated three or four people that they thought were role models in their life. Um, again, these students are slightly more likely to be female, uh, from low decile schools. Um, they too perceive strong whānau and teacher support networks. Um, but they had the lowest motivation to attend university of all of the groups. So again, university wasn't the end goal for these young people, jobs were actually, these young people were more likely to say, I want to aspire, I aspire to this job. It might have been things like, I want to be a fencer, like my, like my dad is, you know, the kids who lived in the rural areas. Um, I can't say with confidence though that these kids understood the pathways to reaching their careers, because that was one of the other points of interest in this study, is that many kids were able to identify the jobs but didn't know the qualifications needed to get there. So they'll say things like, oh, I don't want to go to university, but I definitely want to be a vet because I love animals, you know? Or I want to be a doctor, but now nah, university sounds dumb. Uh, so they had these kind, there were these discrepancies in any way. Um, so it was thriving. The next group, and I'm not going to go through all the groups because we don't have time today, but you're most welcome to have a copy of this presentation if you like, um, for your own interest later, or you can of course get the report. We had thri uh, thriving Māori students, one of our smallest groups. These were uh, Māori students who were trying to balance the com competing da demands of school. So they had, as you can see here, they were still engaged at school, felt pretty safe at school, didn't really know what they were doing at school though, or where they were headed to. So that's what that graph is telling us there. And you can see that it's becoming increasingly orange and red as we move down through here. Um, what these kids did signal is that they high, had high, pe perceived they had high peer support, friends were really important for them, um, and they had the highest motivation to attend university. So maybe that was what was keeping them at school. Maybe that was what was motivating you know, them to stay at school, even though they didn't quite know what job they wanted yet, what career in particular they wanted. The last two groups, the surviving Māori students, were those who were making great efforts to achieve at school, not necessarily feeling good about being school. You can see all of these things are below um, average here. However, they had high numbers of support and their networks, in particular, teachers and whānau. So these kids named a number of teachers and a number of whānau who supported them to do well at school, which is probably why they were still there. Okay? Um, well, these are primary students, so they <laughs> have to be there, you know, it's compulsory that they're there. But these are the kids that would be more likely to drop out as they progressed through school. Um, and again, um, average motivation to attend university. And you can see here our lowest group, the struggling Māori students, these are the ones who are ap apathetic and dissatisfied with school. School just isn't working out for them, and you can see how low. They don't perceive that they turn up ready to learn. 
that they're doing the right things at school. These were the kids who couldn't tell you about their attitudes and just had very negative results there. They didn't feel safe at school um, and that they um, didn't feel motivated to be there either. The only thing that was going for these particular kids were whānau support. Okay, their whānau wanted them to be there. Their whānau wanted them to thrive at school. Yes? Yeah, during the faculties, by any chance, did you know what they are? Um, well, they, they rated themselves extremely below average um, uh, of self-reported achievement, so they perceived themselves as poor learners. Um, we didn't collect data on whether they were um, that, but yeah. So these were the five clusters that fell out of this data. Well, it didn't fall out of, it took a whole lot of work, actually. I don't know why I said that. Um, but if you look at the cluster summaries in general, you can kind of see some patterns in terms of what matters for schools, uh, for students. Whānau support is particularly important. The perception, remember these are student perceptions, the perception that their whānau support them at school and that they have, um, are able to do things like ensure they have a clean uniform. Uh, when they come to school. Um, and when we reported back some of these results to the schools, the school, one of the schools, for example, went out and bought a washing machine and a dryer that they kept at school so that kids could wash their uniforms because not having a clean uniform and feeling smelly was preventing kids from coming to school. Things like that. Um, yes, so there's, this tells us a lot about the things, the kind of contexts for students feeling good about themselves at school, for students feeling like they can flourish in the schooling environment. So it leads me to some questions for you to think about, and um, we don't have enough time for you to think about them in depth here, but perhaps you can come back to them later. But you know, are your students in your classrooms intrinsically, extrinsically, or whānau motivated? Do you know? Do you ask them about, if you got an award, who would you want to show first? You know, what? What is the, the goal of schooling for you? What do you want? Um, and how can you find out and use this information to drive their learning and their academic persistence? Because I can tell you now that so many schools, one of the, one of the secondary school students wrote in their survey, uh, we have deans for behaviour, we have deans for year levels. Who's our dean for success? Who's the dean we know will ring or text our parents when we've done something good. There's none in our secondary school. The deans, you only get called to the dean when you're in trouble. You know, so there were messages in the data about the kinds of things we could be doing differently. Um, what are students' attitudes towards school? Do you know who feels safe and who doesn't at school? Who kids feel connected to? What places they love about their, in their school? Um, how can we help students to better understand their own strengths, their needs, their interests at school? And how can we help them to value education, school and learning? And my answer to that would be focus on what their long-term goals are. Their long-term goals, their students' long-term goals for them and help them to kind of plot a path towards those things through what they're learning at school. And it's not that we're not doing that already, it's just that we're not making it explicit. Young people tell us we're not making it clear for them how the things we're learning at school will contribute to their imagined future selves. And then lastly, what future careers interest your students? Um, how could you help them to think about what they need to pursue those jobs and what local role models could you use to inspire them towards those careers? Because quite often they're choosing careers, this became really evident in the data, because they've got an uncle who does that, or a neighbour who does that, or their favourite teacher is the best teacher of design and technology and all of Whangarei, and so I want to be like him. You know, all of those things. So my next point of interest is that family and teaching role models were very powerful, a very powerful driver in the life of most students. This is all students, not just Māori students. So for primary students, 48% of them, when asked to nominate a role model, chose someone from their family. And over a quarter of them chose their teacher. Okay, so you are also incredibly influential in the lives of students. And what surprised me the most is that for secondary school students, whānau became even more important. Because we do hear this message a lot that whānau engagement and motivation drops off at secondary school, but they're still incredibly important role models for secondary school students. So how might we mobilise 
that in our engagement with parents and students at secondary school. Interestingly enough, given all of the puberty, hormonal, adolescent things going on for secondary school students, 17% of them still nominated one of their teachers and or principals. Principals came out, so many students nominated principals as their role models in the study. Um, it's very important to young people as well. So I think, I think we need to think about that, how influential we are, that for some students, we are the only people that help them to imagine beyond their horizons. You know, so many young people I spoke to in the school had never left Rotorua. That was it. That was their horizon, what was around them in their neighbourhood. So teachers play a really important role. And there are five ways we as role models, not just teacher ones, but as parents and uncles and aunties and nanas, influence the kind of aspirations of young people. The first is that we act as behavioural role models for them. So we show them how to do something. That even though their grandfather left school because he had dyslexia and, you know, didn't enjoy school as an adult, he went back to Polytech and he got a, you know, certificate in business. Now he runs his own lawn mowing business. He's his own boss. It's incredibly inspiring for young people to know those stories. And quite often they talked about their parents, their role models as overcoming some kind of adversity in their life. Nanas who went back to university and got a PhD, those kinds of things. Mums who turned up to school every day, even though she was really petrified of coming to school. She still came to parent-teacher meetings, you know, those kinds of things. Kids notice. So they act as behavioural role models. They represent the possible. So they show us that people like us can achieve great things. People like me, you know? Seeing, I went into a number of schools in, for example, Whangarei, where all but two teachers were Māori in that school, and it was a high population Māori school. And it says something to the kids in that school who come from a, a pretty povertyized neighbourhood, the school I'm thinking about, about the possibility of university, the pop possibility of a career, and the possibility of serving their community, making a real difference. They're also inspirational, so they motive us, motivate us to set aspirational goals and to be courageous, to do things we never actually thought we could. You know those kids who meet a Māori doctor, for example, and think, what? Māori can be doctors? I didn't know this, you know? Those kinds of things, which sounds a bit silly to us, but for some kids, that again sets a new horizon for them. Um, they demonstrate the right way to do things. So I'm, I'm talking about here in line with family values, cultural values. So many, for example, of the Tongan students in the study talked a lot about the importance of humility, the importance of service, respect, um, that their role models had all of these things, that they weren't, you know, it wasn't about money for many of the kids, it was about mana. The mana of those people in their families or in their communities. And we can use any word to describe mana, English words, whatever, but it really was about how that person uh, represented the collective. Um, so these were in line with things like Fano beliefs, iwi, community, church values. Humility was incredibly important to many of these kids. Despite being flash, they didn't, you know, show off about it. And that was something um, many of the adults, the whanau in the, community, uh, in the survey said as well, when they nominated role models for their kids. You know, they said things that aligned with the idea that, well, you can have three PhDs, but if you're an egg, <laughs> all anybody ever remembers about you is that you're an egg, they don't remember your three PhDs, you know? So it's kind of like those kinds of comments. Um, and they importantly influence our self-stereotyping. So they help us to kind of mitigate negative stereotyping. So if we're hearing all the time negative things about people who come from our community, and then we have these role models who are saying, I come from your community and I achieve this, and I do this, and I serve my community in these ways, then we help to kind of dispel those negative stereotypes and then they also positive um, influence our positive self stereotyping so the more kids hear those messages the more they start to align their own identity with the idea that we can be you know who we want to be um, one of the other things that came up for the Māori data in particular is that Māori students show less interest in and often decide against participating in uh, fields where Māori are underrepresented 
Um, so this isn't so much a performance issue as a motivation issue. They just don't see themselves there. And who wants to work in a place where you're going to be the only Māori and no one else understands what on earth you're, you're on about or what you care about? So those kinds of things are quite important, particularly for Māori who express high levels of cultural pride and or who attend Māori medium schooling context, etc. So that's, that's a key you know, um, influence for them in choosing their career. They want to be with other Māori or other people who care about things Māori in workspaces. Um, and the last uh, point of interest I just want to point out to you today um, is this. And this, I started noting, noticing this from about the third school I was writing reports back to. And I wrote 102 school reports back to schools. Is that Pākehā student pride, cultural pride, decreases as students get older. Okay, so you can see here, sorry I shouldn't choose yellow because yellow is really hard to read. But in primary school, Pākehā students, 63% of Pākehā students said, I'm very proud to be Pākehā. And they could identify aspects of their own cultural identity that they were proud of. And if you combine that with mostly proud, that's 83% Pākehā kids saying, I love being Pākehā. I know what that means and these are the things that define me. But as we move through schooling, you can see that that drops markedly down to 23%, and then another 12% who don't want to answer the question. So this drops for all groups, Māori and Pacific, you can see here, they, they experience a 20% drop too. And we can expect some drop because hormones, adolescence, all of the other things that happen to youth where they become more important, possibly, than their cultural identity. But this 40% drop, I think, is something we need to pay attention to. Um, and we need to pay attention to it because in, a multi, in an increasingly multi-ethnic Aotearoa, our cultural identity is going to only become more important, not less important. We're not a great big melting pot as that fabulous song that Annie Crummer sang way back in the day and Margaret Ehrlich, etc. We're actually, if we're not careful, going to become increasingly large, disparate ethnic groups who don't talk to each other. And it is particularly important that the members of our dominant group are able to talk about their own sense of cultural belonging in ways that are positive, in ways that aren't only tied to colonial guilt and negative stories of their, you know, the history, their history in Aotearoa. Um, I was kind of interested in this idea of the drop, so I went to the parent data and I thought, what does looking at the parent data tell me? And what I discovered was 34% of the parents of Pākehā children couldn't or wouldn't answer the question about cultural identity, their child's cultural identity. They said things like, this is not applicable to us. This only applies to others. Or, what a stupid question. Why are you Māori is always so obsessed with identity? Um, they said things like, the background is in the past. I only think of the future. So, to me, this lends some kind of reasoning to the, as yeah, children get older and become more swayed by their parents' perspectives, they tend to lean away from these kinds of con uh, conversations as opposed to leaning towards these conversations. Um, I'm really hoping that the development of a localised curriculum and a refreshed NZC might place emphasis on all children's identities um, in our school. But I think it's incumbent on us to maintain a sense of cultural pride and connection for all students in our schools. We've got to help young people, young Pākehā in particular, to be able to talk about things like questions I might ask are, when did your family come to be in Aotearoa? What were their motivations for coming here? You know, what were they looking for in this place? Where did they settle? What did they do when they settled there? Um, you know, how, how did you come to be in Auckland now? Have you first landed in Stratford. What was it about that? So we can actually get them to go home and have conversations that connect them to this whenua. That connect them to the, the, to the whenua that they came from as well. Not to forget that, but to actually develop a sense of positive association with this place as well. So there are lots of ways we can do that and you'll have your own family ways of doing it. But I think it's incredibly important um, to do this because if we want them to have conversation, if I as a Māori person want to express my cultural pride, want to use my language openly and freely with you all, I need to know that you're open to that. And young people are particularly good at 
opening up their phones and starting to text when you talk about those things to let you know you're boring, I don't want to talk about that, you know? Um, so we've got to start modelling that in schools. And I think teachers need to do this first. We need this kind of self-work to happen for us before we start expecting young people to do it themselves. Um, we need teachers to believe that culture deeply influences the way students learn. And I'm not just talking about ethnicity either. I mean, that's one of the mistakes that I think we make in Aotearoa is we always associate it with, you must talk about being Pākehā. But I mean, Māori kids said, well, we're a waka ama family. We're always out on the river, we're paddling, we go to events, well, that's our culture. Other kids said things like, well, we breed horses, ride horses and sell horses. So we're a horsey family, that's our culture. You know, Many of the kids from, for example, there was a large number of Catholic schools, the Dunedin School Cluster, who worked as a kind of a kahui. They, they participated in the school, all, all of the schools in that cluster. Um, and many of those young people and their families talked about um, their culture as related to church values, as related to community values and so forth. So we kind of need to push the idea that, yes, culture is ethnicity for some of us, but it's also other things as well that make up who we are. Um, I also think one of the things in the surveys that we had some, um, in the teacher surveys, that we had some quantitative Likert items that teachers ticked to um, rate themselves as culturally responsive. Things like, I relate well to Māori students, I give Māori whānau opportunities to teach in my classroom, I know the local history of the area that my school is based, and they tick, them. they tick themselves quite low. Okay, because one of the things they didn't know is how they compared to other teachers. Because the question asked, how culturally responsive do you think you are in relation to the other teachers in your school? And one of the things that came through really clearly is, uh, is that they didn't know what other teachers in their school were doing that was culturally responsive. Um, so they rated themselves low because they assumed everyone else was doing far more than they were possibly doing. So I would encourage you to stop take the good practices in your school, ask other teachers what's happening, ask in your kahui or your cluster about those things. And I leave you with some final questions here. Um, what do we need to do to increase cultural pride and social cohesion? And what are you, who are your students' role models? To, to, ask those kinds of questions as a staff. These questions are for you as staff, as teachers, to ask yourselves before you move out to talking to whānau and students. Now I was going to end, but I've run out of time on talking about some more of my tupuna from my dad's side, but I don't have time to say that. But I am going to end with one last paragraph that I wrote here. And that is, in some ways, our job as educators requires us to be stargazers, like Papa Heck that I talked about at the beginning, to look ahead, to assess what our professional development needs might be and to be aspirational in terms of the ways we want to positively impact the lives of Māori students. We also need to be wayfinders and leaders, not only in terms of helping our students and their whānau to navigate an increasingly complex education system, which is even hard for us as teachers sometimes to wrap our heads around, um, but we must also work alongside, with and on behalf of those students who can't dream big for themselves. Uh, we might have to begin the stargazing process for them. We need to engineer programs of learning that weave together both traditional and contemporary mātauranga Māori and other knowledge systems of the, all of the children in our classroom <coughs> with the expectations of the modern curriculum. All of these roles will require us to bring together, to braid together everything we know about the science of teaching and the wisdoms of the students who sit in front of us every day. Nō reira huri nō e te ruma, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. <laughs>